Welcome to Using Video for Remote Instruction. My name is Carla McKenzie, and I'm the Instructional Technologist for Morton College. Before we begin, if you would like to minimize any disruptions to our session, you're certainly welcome to do so by clicking on the purple tab in the lower right corner, sliding over to the gear, which is actually the My Settings tab, and then clicking the Notification Settings. Here, you will be able to deselect any of the notifications that you may find slightly distracting. In addition, if you need to magnify any content that I present on the screen, you're welcome to do so by clicking the magnifying glass in the upper left corner and then sliding over to the plus or the minus to zoom in or out on any content that I present today. And then finally, you are able to provide digital feedback which I will ask for occasionally. If you click on the avatar in the lower middle of your media panel, if you click the avatar, the sub menu will open and then you're welcome to provide some digital feedback in the form of an emoticon so that I know how you're doing out there today. If everyone can provide that digital feedback for me at this time, I certainly would appreciate it. Let me know you're out there. Great, thank you, thank you. Lots of good listeners here. So at this time, we're providing some digital feedback by clicking the avatar or the silhouette in the lower middle of your screen. It looks like a white circle with a little gray person inside. There we go, lots of folks have found it. Very good, thank you so much. <laughs> and a few folks are surprised to have found it. Yes, so this is, I do teach my students, um, when you tell your students to come to my session, this is one of the um, features that I teach them so that they can provide you some digital feedback. You can ask them a few questions as to how they're doing, or you can ask them questions about the lesson, and then you can monitor which students are getting it or which ones are confused. So this is a great way to obtain some dynamic feedback from yours as well. Our session today should run about 45 minutes. I will leave 15 minutes of question answer at the end. My style today will be to present content and then demonstrate. You're certainly welcome to type any questions that you have into the chat. Periodically throughout the chat, I will take a look at those questions and address them during the presentation. And you're certainly welcome to follow up with me via email. And I do have some training guides and handouts available. Using video. Digital videos are gaining popularity. It is no surprise that this platform is being used widely in the educational setting, in academia. So students are utilizing videos as a tool for learning, but not just in an educational manner, but even just acquiring some additional skills. For example, how often have you even gone to YouTube for yourself and just picked up on a new skill? Maybe changing brakes on your car or maybe figuring out how to put in a window in your house. Those are two that I've tried on my own. Um, but you know, people use it to learn how to um, even play a guitar. So people are using videos to enhance their skills as well as use them in the educational setting. Millennials, the adults between the ages of 22 and say 38, those are the groups that are actually making up about 92% of the digital video viewing audience. So that just happens to directly coincide with our audience here at Morton College. Some of the topics that once seemed difficult to teach are now so much more accessible when you view a video. And I wanna let you know, there's a couple of different schools of thoughts. One of those schools of thoughts, and I particularly am behind this one, is that studies indicate short video clips allow for more efficient processing and memory call, recall. So instead of using a long two hour video or even a long one hour video where we might not keep our students engaged, think about using a shorter video clip 
to keep those students engaged for 20 minutes or 30 minutes. And their memory recall will be a lot stronger than having them recall what happened in the first 15 minutes and they just watched an hour and a half long video. Another, if you must use a long video, then try to pause or do some sort of interactivity during the middle of the video that will allow you to ask your students a question and have them come up with some kind of ideas or critical thinking behind what you're actually presenting content about. There's so many learning styles that videos actually do reach. For example, in a face-to-face -face classroom, we were very worried about our students having all these different learning styles and not being able to reach them. With a video, we're actually able to reach more of those learning styles than ever before. So for example, a video might take care of the verbal as well as the visual as well as the auditory and even the logical component because they're able to see you use reasoning and sequential logic when you complete, say, a math problem or solve some sort of accounting um, issue in a journal. So all of the learning styles that all of our students are out there sitting with, the video is addressing some component of most of those learning styles. So that's a very good thing. So why should you use a video? Well, a video has actually become a staple of the flipped or the virtual classroom. For one, students have a natural curiosity to learn. So if they have a video, we're hoping to motivate them and keep them curious about that particular subject matter. We also hope to engage them. Hopefully we're presenting content that's gonna capture their interests. So we wanna keep them engaged throughout the duration of the video, no matter how long it is. If it's 45 minutes, we'd like to keep them engaged. If it's 20 minutes, we have a greater chance of keeping them engaged for a shorter video than say a longer video. In addition, a video lessens how much of the repetitive teaching that you actually have to do. So for example, in a face-to-face -face setting, you might ha read the faces of the students out there in your audience, and you know some of them are not getting it. They kind of look a little bit confused. So as a good faculty member, I am sure that you've read the nonverbals from your students. With videos, you can lessen some of that repetitive teaching that you would normally have to do because the students are now in control and they can reuse the video and rewatch the video a second or a third time, or they can rewatch portions of the video for just the portions that they did not get. So this is an excellent way to reach our student in more than one way. Have you used videos? That's my question. Have you had challenges with videos or have you had successes? So at this time, I'm going to ask for, a for you to post any, uh, post a chat message for any successes or challenges that you've had with regard to using videos. So I'm going to be watching the chat. This is just a little interactivity that I have right here. And so hopefully we'll have some of you to post a couple of challenges, or maybe you'll post you haven't used video at all. So I just want to kind of see, and it looks like a few folks are maybe are going to, there we go. When I'm pre-recording my lectures and including a video clip in the middle, the video seems to lag. We do definitely have challenges with regard to bandwidth, and you are absolutely right. Um, so the internet itself and connectivity becomes a challenge. Excellent point, Meredith, thank you so much. So we do have to be cognizant of that type of challenge in our videos. And when students are watching that video, are they going to see that? Are they going to experience that same challenge? So sometimes it's just on our end, and then sometimes the students won't actually see uh, that sort of technical glitch. But thank you, Meredith, that's an excellent point. Brewery, I use a lot of TED Talks and I try to use shorter ones, two to 10 minutes, 
Usually the shorter ones are more successful. Longer ones get a bit boring for students. Excellent point. Exactly what I meant to say a little bit earlier, but couldn't really say it. So thank you so much for sharing that. That is so true. So shorter videos, two to 10 minutes. Now you may end up, if you normally have a 60 minute lecture, that's only six 10 minute videos. And students will have such an appreciation and feel like, okay, I can get through it because it's only 10 minutes. And even if they look at your video, the first two, and they come back to the last four videos or the last two videos a little bit later, you've really succeeded in your goal because you've kept their attention for that 10 minutes or that 20 minutes. Excellent point, thank you so much. And then Kara shared with us, hi, yes, I had issues with students being able to upload in a timely manner planning on using short videos. Perfect, excellent. So my message about using a shorter video is actually being experienced um, already throughout. So thank you so much for um, sharing that. And we have talked about our challenges and um, successes, successes being shorter videos, perfect. So what is the process you may ask? The process is create the video, edit the video, and post the video. Now, most of us don't have the pleasure of actually editing the video. So pretty much our process might be create the video, then directly post the video. You can create the video and post the video right away. Editing has a huge learning curve and it also has a huge impact on your time. You don't exactly always have the time to edit a video, but the typical process, and not for all instructors, is to create a video, maybe you have time to do some minimal edits, and then post that video right away. So my presentation will focus on all three today. So when you get ready to record your video, you can go into an asynchronous, I'm sorry, you can go into a session. So in this instance, if you just want to create a session, or if you want to go into the session that's always available, this unlocked session, unless you lock it, you can feel free to do so. The only concern here is that when you create a session and you're currently in it, your students may join you while you're in your session. So one thing I suggest to faculty is that they use their sandbox course to actually record their synchronous and asynchronous sessions, pardon me, to record their asynchronous sessions. And that way, since there's no students enrolled in the actual sandbox course, then you don't have that interruption from your students because your students can join your session at any time. Okay, great. Very good. Thanks, Meredith. All right. So you would create a session in your sandbox course, and then you would enter in the details. So you would enter in the session name and the start date and end date, and then you would go ahead and click create. Now, this is a whole lot better than trying to record your videos at two o'clock in the morning or at 10 o'clock at night, really infringing on your personal time. So if you record them inside of the sandbox, then you'll have uninterrupted sessions. So once you start recording, or at, right after you click uh, create your session, you're going to go up here to the session menu, which is three, three little lines right here. And then you open the session menu and then you click start recording. So this is going to start the recording for either your synchronous live session with your students or your asynchronous session, which is just you. You're the only one in the room. Now here's a few video tips. There are a wide variety of tools out there and available, and most of them have a cost associated with using them. But I do wanna give you a few tips that's gonna um, help you out. So one, try using an external microphone. Sometimes the quality of the built-in mics um, is not as high as actually having an external microphone that's meant to filter out any of that background noise. Also, keep your videos short, which we just kind of talked about. Be well prepared, then wing it. So you might 
I want to practice, and I know I'm so guilty, I know my subject matter, but when you are speaking into a video and you haven't recorded yourself in the past, this is not something that you normally do, things go a little bit unexpected. So you could be real prepared with your lecture. That means practice it a little bit once or twice for about 10 or 15 minutes, and then just wing it. I've given some of my best presentations just practicing for 10 minutes right before the presentation, and then really talking from what I know, really talking from the knowledge that I actually already have in my head. Another tip, be ready to make slight edits. If you can, you can adjust out some of the ums and some of the small mistakes that you actually are making. And Meredith has given us another tip. If you record in a Zoom session, you can start and pause the recording. So you can record, pause before you move, review, and then hit record again. Yes, and that's going to be, thank you, Meredith. I have a Zoom versus Collaborate session coming up. And those are the kinds of things that you need to know. So in a Zoom session, you really can pause, whereas in Collaborate, you cannot. So it really makes a difference to the, what tool you're actually using. Now, I do promote Collaborate because we don't have to um, pay any additional monies. The school is already paying for that. And then, um, and that's just in case your session goes beyond the 40 minutes or so. But definitely, that's a very good tip. Also, position the camera slightly above your eyes. Your students, uh, they have trouble making co eye contact with you even in a face-to-face -face course. So if you're sitting there in a video having the burning eyes on them, that's going to be a little intimidating. So if you direct your attention and it looks like you're still focused on them, but you're not actually, you have a focal point right above, then they will be more engaged with you because they feel like, oh, I'm sitting here. My teacher can really see me. No, we can't really see them, but it gives them that impression when we look directly at them in our video. And then lastly, be slightly cognizant of the background imagery and your location. Nothing worse than having a poster on the wall right behind you that has something uh, just a little bit, you know, not appropriate or even a color scheme or something like that. So just being cognizant of the background behind you and your location. Another good thing about Zoom is that you can put your backgrounds in behind you. So um, and I'll talk about that as well next week in my class. Okay, focus here. When you are actually looking at the screen and recording yourself, think of the background as a three by three grid. The best focal points for the viewer are actually on the lines. And you would think that this is the best place to be or right here is the best place to be. Here, these four areas, yeah, <laughs> these four areas, that I've outlined here are actually the best focal points for the viewer. In other words, if your viewer is right here, if your viewer is watching you and you're right here in the middle, they're more likely to disengage with you as opposed to you being right here. So there's a lot of psychological and brain activity kind of going on and studies have shown these are the best focal points to position yourself when you're recording your video, as opposed to being directly in the middle. And why is that? Your students are getting distracted by all everything kind of around you. And, and it doesn't have to be a background like this where there's trees behind you. It can be an all black background, but their eyes are still trying to move to those four corners. So if you position yourself here, you're close enough to this corner or close enough to this corner to where your students don't need to div divert the, your, their eyes too often. And then be sure to stop the recording. You go right back to the same area and stop the recording. And this is in Collaborate. If you don't stop the recording, the recording won't render until the video is stopped. So you'll never get a recording until 
the video times out after four hours. Blackboard is going to time out after four hours of recording, and you only intended to record a session for 20 minutes or maybe 45 minutes. But if you don't stop, the recording will not automatically stop even when you leave the session, and it won't time out until four hours later. And it will take a long time for a four hour video to render. It will not generate. So even right now, if we record our videos in 15 minutes, even right now, that 15 minute video is going to take about five, 10 minutes possibly to render. Or if it's a 45 minute video, it might take 30 minutes to render or 20 minutes to render. Imagine how long it will take for a four hour video render itself. So it will almost, you know, it will take the next day um, to be actually available in your recordings. So you want to make sure that you stop that video. And of course, to locate your recordings, you'll click on that session menu once it has recorded and generated. And as you can see, here's all the recordings. I always record my sessions. And you're going to be able to watch the recording, download it, delete it, edit the recording settings, pretty much the name of the recording, copy the link. So I want to let you know that as your students, if you want to record in Collaborate and in your Sandbox course, then you can download the file and then upload it into your current course or you can copy the link and paste the link for your students and they'll actually be watching it on um, Blackboard's Collaborate server. So you, you do not have to feel that you're going to be compromising space or anything like that if you copy the link and upload a web link for your students to watch it wherever it exists. And, and these are the options for your students as well. They can watch, there you go. They can watch it, they can download if you allow them to download. And uh, you certainly have the ability to do so, allow them to download or they don't have the ability to edit the settings or delete, but you have the ability to copy the link. So the only options available to the students specifically is to watch it and download. And then if you want them to, be able to watch it, they have to access it from their actual course and not from your sandbox course. If you want them to be able to watch it from your sandbox course, you'll need to be able to copy the link and paste it for them. All right, and then lastly, there is a screen recording feature in PowerPoint. So I'm not exactly sure how many of you have seen this before, and I will demonstrate it. The challenge here will be the file size and the file type is whatever it generates, which I think it's an MA4 or M4A. Is that file type going to be compatible with Blackboard? And there's some tweaking. You can tweak the audio files, you can tweak any screen recordings, and then they will be able to upload into Blackboard. This process does not happen automatically. So there is about six small steps that you have to take to get any kind of screen recording that you do in PowerPoint into Blackboard. They are not one for one directly compatible. So at this time, I'm going to provide a demonstration to you access of a video, edit a video, take a look at a screen recording in PowerPoint, and then upload the video. And so you can kind of see how that whole process goes. So I'm going to share my screen with you at this time. And before I do, just want to make sure that I don't see any questions into the chat. So it looks like maybe there's no questions. So that's perfect. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you at this time. And so if I go
Okay, did I get kicked out, you guys? Okay, hang on a second. I need some feedback. Did I get kicked out or what happened? I seem to feel like I've lost you for a moment. Okay, all right, very good. Okay, so I'm glad I'm back. All right, so I'm back now. I don't know what happened. All righty. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen with you at this time. And I'm going to go into a different course, and hopefully this will work exactly as I anticipate. I'm going to go into Blackboard Basics, and it looks like everybody's still with me. And I'm going to go into my virtual session. And I'm just going to go into my sandbox. I'm sorry. I'm just going to go into my course room. Remember, this one's always available unless you lock it. So I'm going to go ahead and join this course room. And I'm going to start my recording. I'm the only one in this room. So I'm gonna go ahead and start my recording. And I get a little visual clue that the session is being recorded. And then I can just start. So if I have some content that I wanna share or a file that I wanna share, I'm just gonna go ahead and upload that file. And while I'm doing so, I do need to make sure that I share my audio as well. So I do need to take that off. And then if I want to share my video, I can share my video as well. All right. So here I am sharing. I'm the only one in the room. I complete my presentation. And then I am very cognizant to go back and stop the recording. Once the recording has stopped, then I leave the session and now the session will begin to render and generate. So eventually, I hope to have in my class all of these recordings that I can go back and access. Here's all of my recordings. And so some of these recordings, these are only the ones that were in the last 30 days. If I need my recordings from before then, I can go ahead and put in recordings for a range and then indicate the range. So if I'm looking for the recordings that I did from last spring, I'll have to locate those by looking for the recordings in a range. And remember, that's right up here. So you only see the most recent recordings within the last uh, 30 days. But once I have the recording, I can click on it. And right away, I can watch the recording. I can download it. And I can review the recording settings, which is pretty much just change the recording name. I can also delete or I can copy. So all of that is completely up to me. So suppose I wanted to watch this right now, I could do that. And I just want to show you. I'm going to unmute. And I can start the video. Fine. I can actually share a file, which I'm going to do right now. So if I had a lecture for my students, here it is, right here. <laughs> and now I'd like to tell you how to locate a previous session. All right. So and that just happens to be one of the sessions, um, this same session that I recorded on Tuesday. So I just happened to have pulled that one up. But you can see here that my, my video is not posting. Instead, I'm just using audio. So if you want to just post a picture and talk to your students and they just see your face, you are certainly welcome to do that. The challenge becomes that they're not going to see the actual interaction from your face and your gestures, et cetera. But you're certainly welcome. In fact, I encourage you to do so if you want to give them a few quick tips, no more than about 10 minutes if it's just an audio file that you want them to see. So that's one. When you're looking for additional sessions, you'll need to click the filter and change your box, your checkbox. All right. And so here's me presenting an actual slide presenting from all material. upcoming sessions to all previous sessions. This all righty. So I'm going to stop this session that particular at this time. I'm going to stop that video. And allow me to exit that particular video.
So it looks like I'm hoping not to be stuck in that video. So here I can skip forward. And I'm not sure if you guys have seen this. Your students have the ability to go back or they can skip forward a little bit. So it kind of helps them to be able to do that. All right, so I'm just gonna close this. You can close this tab. And now I'm right back here at all of the rest of my videos that I have. So my recording probably did not render yet. It was a very short one. And let's see if I have one that has today's date on it just yet. So this is my session a little bit earlier today. Yeah, so it's not going to render that fast, but I, I did want to show you some of the recordings that I had already done. In addition, what I'd like to do is edit a video. So right now I'm going to pull up Camtasia. And Camtasia is a screen recording. It allows video editing as well. So some of you use other um, video editors, and there's certainly a lot of them out there. So hang on a second. I'm looking for, kind of seems like something went a little wacky. All right. So here, this is Camtasia. And Camtasia is a video editor and it records your screen as well. And this is called the timeline. So a few people have asked me to give a demonstration in this as well. All of the editing tools use some sort of timeline. So here, this is actually my audio. And if I were to play a video to be used by students in this video, we will create so this is my audio and it's a separate file from my actual video. Here's my actual video here. So this is my audio. So suppose I wanted to increase audio. A virtual session into the event details. I can do that simply by clicking on the session and lowering or making it a little bit higher, like changing the volume here. So that can make it lower or that can make it higher. If I wanted to silence a portion of this video. I would just take my playhead, select all of the content that I want to silence, and then I can either cut it or I can right click and silence it. And you may be thinking, why would you want to silence the video, the audio? If I said, um, or if there was a phone ringing in the background, then I can just very easily kind of take that out. So it's really nice that the audio portion is different from the actual video portion. And I can edit each one of those separately. In addition, if I wanted to add some time in here, I can just simply right click or I could select my text here, then right click and insert some time. So if I still have things going on in the video, I can insert time in either the audio or the video. Right here, this one's gonna insert time into the audio so that I have some dead space because there's something going on on the video that I want uh, people to see. In addition, if I wanted to select just the uh, video here, I can once again highlight and I can actually cut both of these at the same time, the audio as well as the video, or I can turn off this track. I can completely disable this track and then you won't see the video. And then I will be cutting out just the audio portion. So once again, all video editors have this. This is not new, it's just very convenient technology to be able to edit the video, cut it out, seam it together. If I want to combine two videos, I just put them pretty close together. And then I might even put in a transition. So some kind of transition, if you're watching my screen over here or some sort of checkerboard, just something. We don't want you to overdo or overuse these, but just something right here for you to kind of take a look at as the two videos are seeming together. So any kind of transitions that you can use, as long as they're not overused, almost like in PowerPoint. All righty. And at this time, I want to go back and show you one thing. It looks like uh, something, one thing got cut out. 
Yeah, something actually was cut out of my video. So I apologize for that. Yes, it did get cut out. Okay. All righty. So right now, what I want to also show you is some of the media that you can use or annotations. If you click here, you know, you have the ability to put any one of these on the screen and then you they can fly in or they can fly out just to create some interactivity in your video. So you don't have to become a sophisticated video editor. You just need to keep them engaged just a little bit. And even if you stop the video, uh, put something up on the screen, whether it's an image that they're not expecting to see, then engage them at the least, just a little bit. And they'll have a huge appreciation for that. So right now, I'm going to uh, show you a um, PowerPoint where I'm actually going to use screen recording. So I'm going to click on screen recording. That's on the insert tab. And if I have a PowerPoint, I'm going to insert this particular screen recording. Here's where I can insert some video or some audio. But this is a screen recording. And right now I have the right resolution and I have the right region selected. So I'm just gonna select record. And then I'm going to go to another, and then I'm gonna go to another area to just get some motion on the screen right now. So if I were talking to my students about the Morton College Panther Portal, I might do something like this and I might explain, and then I might explain how to get to Blackboard. After doing that, that's my screen recording, and then I'm gonna stop the recording at this time. So it stops the recording. <laughs> Shift, Q, and the windows. And it's, there we go. All right, now this recording, appears right here in PowerPoint. And, and I probably have some editing of this video before I actually post it. But this video was actually created, and you can call it a video, but it's a screen recording. It is a video of some sort. And it was created directly in PowerPoint. Now, once again, your challenge will be space. These short video clips add a lot. But if you're going to demonstrate something to your student and it's on your computer, you can share your screen with them or you can create it in PowerPoint, just a real quick audio file. This does add space. So these audio files or these video files created here will be space intensive. They'll take up a lot of space. So and I can then just I'm play. going to go to another. And then I'm going to go to another area <laughs> to just get some motion on the screen right now. So if I were talking to my students, so there is my screen recording and I can put that directly in my PowerPoint and I have created PowerPoints and left them out there, uploaded them for my students. Not like a ton of these because it becomes to get very large. But if I want to explain something and I want to make sure that they're actually going through the slides that I've posted, I'll put an audio file, a short one, on each slide or every four slides or something like that. But if you haven't used this in the past, this is a way to get a quick screen reporting right here in um, PowerPoint. All righty. So I'm going to come back to you right now. Stop sharing my screen. And I have a couple of questions for you. There we are. OK. All right. So here we go. I see that there are some questions. To clarify, is the course room the same as the sandbox? No. The course room is not the same as the sandbox. The course room is the area. Your virtual session has two options. The first option for your virtual session is that you can go into a course room, which is always available and never scheduled. That's up here. It's always available, meaning your students can even go into that course room. 
If you click create session, you are scheduling a supervised session with your students. If you just want to not schedule anything, you can go into the course room, which is available to you and available to your students unless you lock it. In my trainings, I do tell uh, faculty to lock their course room so that students are not in there unsupervised. But certainly, if it's available, you can use it. If it's not available, you can unlock it. You have full control of the course room. The sandbox is actually another course. So for example, this is the course that you can play with. And I'm going to show you on my screen. So bear with me. If we go into Blackboard and I go into my Blackboard, there, here's my sandbox. It's a completely different course. So these are all the courses that I'm instructing. But this is the course that I get to upload all of my files and I can see and develop my course even without being inside of my course. So the sandbox is just like the sandbox when you were a little child. You can just get in there and play in the sand. Try out some of the uh, features in your course, upload some files or keep files that you want to um, have in a future course. You can always copy them over. But the sandbox and the course room are different. Very good question. All right, I'm going to come on back. Can you repeat those steps for sharing files and the screen? Your sandbox should exist, Prairie. Um, it should exist already, but if not, yes, you can request that. Jolene, my colleague, you should always have a sandbox course. If you don't have anything, you have a sandbox course. And then can you repeat the steps for sharing files and the screen? Sure, so when you're in a session, and I'm going to demonstrate this, and you're going to see the tunnel vision. When you're in a session, you click Share Files, which is right here. And you can see that on my screen. And you click Share Files, and then you add a file right here. OK, this is where you add a file, and then you could upload it. So I'm not sure, let's see, if that um, answers your question or not sharing files. So when you're sharing a file, your students do not see your video. Your video is in the lower left corner. When you're sharing your file, the file has the focus. They're not even able to see your picture. Your picture and the video uh, are in the lower left. I hope that answers that, Maria. Is captioning available in Collaborate? Yes, but it's manual. Captioning means that you assign someone to start typing everything that you say. There is no automatic captioning in Collaborate. So if you're in Collaborate and you designate someone as the actual captioner, so watch this. If I say beta here is going to be my captioner, that means that she's going to be typing out everything that I say and what she types is going to appear across the screen. So with your single sessions, they're typically, you work independently, we don't have automatic captioning. That means, and, and some of the companies assign a captioner, and they're actually out there typing what you say. Yeah, <laughs> okay, very good. How do we link, I'm sorry, let's see. How, does Morton Kyla have a Camtasia account? Do we need to get your own? Um, Morton College has a Camtasia account for me. Um, <laughs> um, right now, I use Camtasia because I use video and create video for faculty purposes, for my training purposes. Um, they do not have an enterprise-wide Camtasia account at this time. But like I said, there's a lot of free. You don't need to use Camtasia. That's the one I use. There's a lot of free editing software out there, so many to name, absolutely so many to name. How do we link collaborate to attend? Is that to attendance, Lou? Or is that where you're getting at? Collaborate. Okay, I think that's what you're asking me. How do we link collaborate to attends or to attendance? Um, you collaborate automatically creates an attendance for you. So I'm sharing my screen. Allow me to show you. 
in my course. So here, I'm gonna take a look at all of my sessions. And this is a session that I had. Uh, and if I just click the three dots over here for any session, so let's say I have a previous session. This is my maintaining integrity with respondents session. And I just click view reports. I can see my attendance report right here. I had 12 attendees and if I click, I can see who attended and then I can download it. So Collaborate is keeping track of all students that join and leave and your total time. And I actually let the deans know that you guys have attended these sessions also. This is how I let them know because I look at the attendance. So I'm not actually formally taking attendance. Now in Collaborate, when you create a session, you can go over here to attendance reporting and then you can set up your attendance. Now what this will do is actually use the attendance tool. This will report back to your attendance tool. And then you can see here, I have one student, John Guest, in my attendance tool. And John has been attending all of my sessions. He was absent in this one, but he was present in this one. This will automatically be populated in Collaborate or Collaborate will automatically populate Blackboard Learn, the attendance section. So that's how you can track attendance, but you really don't need to. The first method that I showed you, if you wanted to track attendance, you could click on any session and then click the session options and view reports and see who attended your session. As you can see, this incorporating video section, I had 30 attendees in the Tuesday session. And then I can view the report and see their exact names. And I can even take a look at the polls that I created. So that happens automatically. You don't need to use, you don't need to do anything special to get Collaborate to do that. All right. So, okay, do we need to, yeah, that should be done. How do you share your screen? You can share your screen by clicking the share content, which is right here, share content, and then share application. So right now I'm actually sharing my screen, but I, you click share application and this gives you options. You can share your entire screen, just a specific window or just a specific tab. So you have choices on that. And let's see. All right, so I think I've answered all questions. And so I wanna go back and take a look at my file. Okay, so that one is a short one here. Yeah, these are the same. All right, so I think, and you guys have been such a great audience, I think, I have covered everything that I want to cover in this session. If you bear with me a moment, I there is a, a screen that's missing. There is a, and yeah, I, I, I think it's gone. I'm missing an actual, um, yeah, I'm missing an actual sheet in my presentation, but that's okay. You guys have been a fabulous, fabulous audience. Is the new Blackboard going to be compatible with other files besides mm, PowerPoint and Word? And by new Blackboard, that the Collaborate Ultra or Blackboard Ultra, they are supposed to go to that this spring. So basically because we, yourself and myself, have invested a lot of time in getting you up to speed on this version of Blackboard. And because there's an additional cost associated with the servers and testing servers that we need um, in order to test it properly for you, they have decided to wait until spring. And so that way you get something out of all the training that I've done because it's drastically different. And I've invested a little time in creating all these videos and things like that for you. And, and the staff has just learned. I don't think the staff has learned 
as much in the past as so many of them have learned this past summer and since May. Um, so everyone's so proud of the staff because they've learned so much and you can just hear all the excitement. So because the, the faculty are so well-versed in this version now, um, they're planning to go um, in early spring. And that'll give us a chance to get everything right. And then I'll have all these training sessions all over again for you. Um, so here is a new Blackboard. So right now, Blackboard is compatible with PowerPoint and Word, but mostly PDF. So Kara, I'm assuming that you're referring to when you add files. Right now, you can only add PDFs and, yeah. So right now, you only add PDFs and PowerPoints. It would be nice for you to be able to add a Word file or add an Excel file or even um, an access database. That, that would be really cool. But as far as I know, they're still just um, only allowing you to share PowerPoints and PDFs. Um, I did look into that and I believe it's it's kind of the same way. So those are the only files and images. You can also share GIF files and um, JPEGs right now, but now, no, they haven't updated any functionality. And, and partly because any document that you have in Word you know you can easily save it as a uh, as a PDF. So I just want to show that real quick, just in case there are some folks out there who don't know that. So that's going to be important for you. So I'm sharing my screen right now, and I'm going to launch Word. And I'm sure Kara knows this. Um, any file that you have, you can simply save it as a pdf save as and i can browse for the file and i can save it as a pdf so any file that you have can be saved as an actual pdf and that may be why they're not too much of in a hurry because microsoft has already made this available to us and kind of convenient it's a little inconvenient because you have to cognizant uh go back and and complete another step but any file that you have in Word can be saved as an actual PDF, as well as, and even when you're in PowerPoint, you can save your file, save as, and then here, I'm gonna browse for the file, and once again, I can save it as a PDF. So because of all the functionality out there, they're not in too much of a hurry to give us any additional options with regard to that. All righty. Okay, so I think we're still out there. And let me just check and make sure. Any questions? Okay, would it, be, it would be nice. You are so right. It would be nice for the links to open in PowerPoint. Got it. I understand. It would be nice for the links to open. It would be nice for them to be able to see some interactivity on this screen. So you are absolutely right. And now I definitely I understand. So you are you are absolutely correct. It would be very nice for them to see what's going on on your screen or for you to do some of the things, uh, the flashy transitions that you can do in PowerPoint. You'd like for those flashy transitions to be uh, come across on your screen. So I, I completely agree. All right, I am starting to, I'm starting virtual teaching and I'm still confused. Do we only have Blackboard or do we have Blackboard Ultra? For Collaborate, for Collaborate only, we have the Ultra version. For Blackboard, everything that you do before you click that join set, I'm sorry, everything that you do before you click create session, that is all, I'm not create session, pardon me. Before you click a uh, virtual session, the moment that you click virtual session, you're in Collaborate Ultra. Everything else is in Blackboard Learn. Yes, yeah, so we're using Blackboard and Blackboard Learn only. We have not made the transition to Blackboard Ultra, and that's what it's going to be called, Blackboard Ultra. 
they may change their minds, but right now that's what the powers that be are saying. So for this video, you guys have done such a wonderful job and I do appreciate. I'm probably going to edit it a little bit because a couple of things got a little choppy. So by the time you review it, I hope that it's a very smooth um, video for you. Um, a couple of windows didn't open as I had anticipated. All right, so I'm just gonna give you a very quick poll. I always like to do that. All right, so did you enjoy our session today? Or there you go. Thank you so much. Perfect. Perfect. I always like when my faculty do enjoy my sessions. Thank you so much. I